I want to point out this is the 85th copy of the commissioner. We weren't really uh, recording. I thought we were. I, apparently, it was operator error without my producer. Uh, I didn't hit the right button, but we're recording now. This is the 85th copy of the commissioner. That's Wes Marino. We have uh, Eric Gilmore here as well. And we have Steve Brentro from We Are Perdido. We're going to talk. Um, once again, Wes, though, you know, getting, and I appreciate that update. And, and you're right. That night of that tornado, I, I actually happened to be out at my condo uh, on Pensacola Beach and uh, our, our unit, uh, our building in particular, took millions of dollars, millions of dollars in damage from that one event. So these things come up and you talk about our staff and their resiliency and their experience. If you think about communities around the country, how many communities can say they've recovered from multiple hurricanes and an ice storm? multiple fires and these other uh, issues that we've had, these floods. I mean, we've we've really had every kind of calamity you could imagine. And, and this community never ceases to amaze me with their talent, dedication, professionalism. So we're very fortunate. And Eric, you know, a lot of your guys, they they don't get the, they really don't get the credit they deserve for what they do. Same thing with the sheriff's office and everyone. Um, so uh, I'm very proud of this county. I'm very proud of what we've done in public safety. Very proud on uh, that we've you know provided the raises that we have to uh, to keep us competitive with other entities. But um, uh, just real quickly to double back though, since we weren't recording, Wes, um, we did get an offer for Dr. Horton. It was counter offer, twenty four point one million for uh, for two hundred ninety seven acres. That's 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 the, about the long and the short of it, right? It is. That's the long and the short of it. And it, we'll start going through the contract today, like we said earlier. Uh, terms, conditions, contingencies, uh, you know, re requests that they have built into the contract. We'll have to go through those and we'll go through them, you know, section by section, line by line. And then we'll have our discussions that we need to have with the board and uh, we'll develop a strategy and we'll move forward. That's right. And, and we, and just for everyone's knowledge, uh, we didn't get this till late in the afternoon. It was right at close of business. So, uh, a lot of it will get digested today. There's, uh, the contract's 27 pages, has a lot of exhibits. They 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 are requesting some, um, I guess, some changes, um, some uh, adjustments uh, to the to the existing master plan. Um, but they do acknowledge they have to build to the the, the form code. So it, we'll have to go through it and see exactly what they're asking for, what it means. But um, uh, you know what we said before, and we'll just kind of reiterate, a lot of these changes were necessitated by the legislature passing the Live Local Act in the last session, which allows commercial property to immediately be converted to residential apartments without any uh, without any county having any jurisdiction over it. They, the legislature preempted us, and the basis for that was the lack of affordable housing and, and the housing crisis. So um, that was the reason we had to change that contract. That's the reason we're getting a lot less money for the property. The, the silver lining is that 240 acres, the county will be able to control what happens there. And that was the only way we could protect that from becoming more densely populated uh, residential, which is what would have happened. Because I've seen this over the years in District 1, I'm sure Wes and Eric and probably Steve to a lesser degree has probably seen this. These developers find different various ways. Okay, I want this, so I'll do a I'll do a mixed use or I'll do a planned use development. And they say all these things, and we're going to do this. We're going to have shops and retail, and then they never build it. They just build the residential and cash in, and they never never build it. So um, the only way we could prevent that from happening was to keep that 240 acres. So a lot more on that will come this week as staff digests it, as the attorney and the administrator digest it. But um, I, I think it's encouraging and. If it goes through just as it is, I mean, you know, who knows what my counterparts want to do? You know, there's five five men going to vote on this eventually, but we could go back and forth. The price could go up. Um, we could ask for concessions back. But at the end of the day, we owe about 14.5 on this property, right? We're about 14.5 into it. So if this deal happened, that's a, still a $10 million profit. Plus we have 241 acres that we can create good jobs with. So I still think there's a win here. Um, there are going to be some people, you know, with their hair set on fire. They're not going to like it. They're going to be doomsday naysayers, but I, you know, I can't control people. Um, the, the fact is, the reality of it is, um, we're going to get the best deal we can, and we're going to move forward. We're going to take any excess profit that we make off this property, and we're going to reinvest it in legacy infrastructure uh, deficiencies, which are all over the county. We know that uh, we see the storm damage, we see the flooding, we see the you know, the roadways, the traffic. So we're going to be able to take that money and invest it. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. So, Wes, sorry for that again. Any final thoughts on the county uh, going yeah, forward? I have one final thought. Um, last Tuesday, my Tuesday night, the board awarded $23 million right. worth of projects. That is precedent setting. Uh, I said at the meeting that 
You know, we used to pride ourselves if we did $20 million worth of construction in a year. <laughs> and we awarded $23 million in, in one meeting. And that's just phenomenal. That just, I tell you, again, a testament to the staff. Everybody playing their role. Everybody driving. Jeff loving good at purchasing. They're driving better than I've ever seen purchasing drive since I've been with the county. And uh, I met with engineering Tuesday afternoon. And there's going to be some agendas coming up. But it's going to be a lot of work going out. It's going to be awarding a lot of work. And the staff is just doing phenomenal. Yeah, so I just want to double back on that a little bit. Hey, um, Wes, I'm getting a lot of comments on the Facebook feed right now. When I believe that contract's a public record already. I didn't link it yet because I wanted to read it first. But is that that is a public record, right? It, it, it will be. I, I would like the opportunity to meet and go through it first. Sure. Uh, you know, but yes, it, it will end up being a public record. Okay, so yes. Uh, so the answer uh, to that question to Gail is it will be a public record um, and staff will be releasing it after they have a chance to go through it. Uh, just make that request. So there's that. I'm sure that that will count as a request for it, I'm assuming. Um, sidewalks and bike trails to connect Warrington to Perdido. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm jumping ahead. Let's go to uh, let's go to Eric. Eric, what do you got going in public safety? I saw your report this week. And by the way, Eric Gilmore sends a comprehensive public safety report every week. And I appreciate you doing that. It lists all the events, all the fire calls, district by district, the type of fire they are. It's very detailed. Um, I'm curious, uh, Eric, does 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 our newspaper ever request any of that information from you? Uh, I know not from their report, but from time to time, they'll pick up key pieces that they want to talk about. Uh, whether it's structure fires or certain calls or anything, but we do get daily requests on our uh, events that we have that they, you know, they listen to the scanners and they hear the fires go out, but they don't request the uh, comprehensive report. But anyway. Gotcha. I appreciate you doing that. So what's going on in public safety? No, uh, we get a lot going on. As Wes <laughs> mentioned, we just finished up the blues. Uh, that was a, that was a good weekend. Unfortunately, you know, Thursday and Saturday, you had to cut the show short, but that just goes, that's a testament to our, our uh, men and women out there who are, monitoring the weather and making sure everybody's safe on the beach, knowing that we had thunderheads, uh, you know, thunderstorms rolling in uh, to get people off the uh, beaches in a timely manner to make sure that we didn't have any uh, episodes, uh, any, anybody uh, take a lightning strike or anything like that. So our emergency management staff and having, you know, Scotland Williams, our uh, resident EM uh, meteorologist on staff was very helpful for her to sit there and monitor these storms. And then uh, for the guys to work with, uh, the Navy and uh, Lee uh, Davis out there at Santa Rosa Island Authority to make a determination to call the show a little early uh, for public safety. Uh, that worked out really well. And, you know, Friday was a great show. They did the entire show. They get cut yep. short. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, we had to cut it short. But fortunately enough that the Blues did get to fly and the, and the uh, crowds did get to see uh, some of the Blues show before they had to cut it short. But uh, and, and as Wes said, you know, it, it takes everybody. It, it really does for the boy. It is a, it is a large event for us. Uh, we do a lot of planning for it. There's a lot of meetings that go into it prior and after uh, the, the show. That way we make sure we get our ducks in a row. And, uh, you know, EMS, fire, beach lifeguards, emergency management, down to public works. We draw those guys in because they do play an integral role. Even though you see us with the, the vehicles with the red lights, those guys are quietly going around there. And they're, they're making sure the, the trash cans, the dumpsters, uh, that even beach safety stuff. So, you know, uh, accessible walkways and everything. We work with those guys and say, we're seeing this and they, it, it's everybody, law enforcement, it, it, everybody. And it, it, uh, they do a good job. And, uh, like I said, a lot of planning goes in there. A lot of people don't realize how much planning really goes into the Blue Angel Air Show. Uh, the mul multitude of meetings that we have to make sure that we are, we're hitting on all cylinders to make it safe. Uh, so we have, we did, uh, finish that up and everybody kind of, Takes a sigh, you know, and here and hit it again. So, because uh, that's that's like I said, one of our big ones. Uh, we fortunately, unfortunately, we've had a rash of structure fires here lately. Um, I've seen last it. week we had three structure fires in one day. Uh, that that's a high number for us here in Escambia County. Usually, we'll go one structure fire every two days. Uh, you know, we'll get the anomaly where we get two back to back or something like that. But uh, we've been having a lot of structure fires here lately. I think in the past. A uh, week or so, we've had a, a nine. And when I say structure fires, I'm talking about actually working structure fires, not smoking a house or an appliance smoking or anything. I'm talking to the guys that had to deploy a hose, do a full on attack on it. And uh, but uh, a lot of it has been due to uh, careless use of heating sources. So everybody just, you know, take your time. I know it's hot. I know, you know, we, we're under the, the heat stress right now and everything, but take your time, make sure you're watching your heat sources and uh, being safe around those. But we've had a huge rash of, uh, you know, structure fires here lately, unfortunately. Hey, Eric, um, let me, when we're talking, since we're talking about fire real quick, um, tell me about the staffing. I know we've got the cadet program. I know that we've provided raises for the rank and file. And recently, Wes was able to negotiate 
a, a raise and increase for the lieutenants. So um, I know we're we're working on a new fire chief right now, but um, how's our staffing in fire looking these days? Our staffing's good. Uh, so I, I don't know the actual number we're down now, but we do have, we're on our third round of the cadet program good. and we've gotten some good cadets and, and two of them have finished up and those guys are actually in houses now. They're actually running the rigs Fantastic. and everything like that. So I still think we're down around eight people and that's because we've had retirement or uh, promotions or things of that nature. So, you know, when people retire and you promote up, uh, but it's not, it's not as bad as it was a, a year and a half ago or a year ago. Uh, and then, you know, right now in the budget, we've got uh, 21 additional firefighters uh, so far approved in our budget cycle. So October 1, we can hire 21 additional more uh, to help, uh, you know, put some more guys in houses out in the county to help us out with staffing levels. So, uh, but the staffing levels are not bad right now. And as I said, the, the cadet program has been very beneficial to us and uh, helpful to getting, <clears throat> filling those staffing levels because we're just not drawing those guys who had their search to come here, I mean, they're from South Florida or whatever, and maybe they don't want to move here or they're happy at the house or the station they're at or the department they're with. And it's, you know, when you only got three academies in the region here and region one's from here to Apalachicola River, and they're only 20, turning out 20 guys a year at each one of those things, you know, and, and all the departments are looking for manpower and staffing, you're in that competition. So uh, we did get awarded with Michelle Salzman the $1 million for, to go toward our training facility. So right now we've got about $3 million uh, to go toward our training facility. It's going to be up on Camp Strand Road. And once we get that up and running, we anticipate getting uh, uh, it certified to the state of Florida Fire College. And we could do our own uh, yes. training center yes. and do our own training and not have to, you know, go out and go with George Stone or any of the other t- so that we can we can kind of dictate how fast we roll through our academy. So we're looking forward to that, the opportunity to do that. Hey, Eric, you had mentioned traffic at Pensacola Beach with the uh, with the air show. And this yes. I got a question here. It's I, really probably to Wes and you, but um, it's from one of our viewers uh, with the roundabout issues on Perdido Key. Is the idea of one at Pensacola Beach being discarded or is it still on the table? Would you support one? there with the volume of traffic on the island well from my perspective i've always been agnostic i'm going to answer a little bit and then i'm gonna let you guys answer but i've always been agnostic on these traffic circles and um i actually voted to support it when uh the previous commissioner in district four uh grover robinson wanted to put all his discretionary into building two roundabouts out there so um but i will say this since that time obviously there was not support and it, that didn't move forward but uh at pensacola beach but since that time the county has enacted a lot of changes out there um i'm out there all the time i have a condominium out there and i whenever i i'm not renting it i'm out there um at, at all different times and i'm telling you traffic since since we automated that toll booth since we synced the lights in Gulf Breeze and since we added the hot right um, onto Fort Pickens Road and put the traffic in Casino Beach going a different, I think the traffic is moving smoother out there than it ever has before. And I don't think it needs a roundabout. In my opinion, I know the current commissioner has not brought that forward. Um, so I don't I don't know. From my perspective, I don't I don't know that it's necessary. Wes, do you have any thoughts on that? Is there any talk of, of that coming back forward out of P- Pensacola Beach? There's no, there's no current discussion uh, about constructing a roundabout on Pensacola Beach, uh, all for all the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, and then, you know, every weekend, uh, every day, we have somebody monitoring that light there at the intersection. Right, right. And if Fort Pickens gets backed up, we can change the timing on the light remotely. Or if it gets back to Point Vieta de Luna, we can change the timing of the right, uh, light remotely. So there's a lot of effort that's gone into uh, monitoring that light and monitoring the traffic and bettering the traffic situation there on the beach. Again, as I mentioned earlier, 25,000 plus cars coming onto the beach. You figure there's three or four people in every car. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of traffic, a lot of, a lot of moving parts. But I think we put a monumental effort together to, to, to make all of those improvements. You have the beach access road now. And uh, not saying it can't be better, uh, but uh, I think at the right, currently there is no uh, active discussion about a roundabout on Pensacola Beach. Thank, thank you for that. Well, we're getting questions now that we're talking about fire and fire stations. Now, I will point out for the for the viewers and those who watch this uh, later when it's taped, um, the Beulah fire station's coming out of the ground. The steel trusses are up. The roof is going on. And my understanding uh, in speaking to folks about that uh, in in the uh, engineering department and the uh, building services department is that uh, that's a November open. So uh, is that still what you're hearing, Eric? That's still what we're hearing in November, yes. Wow. 
what a fantastic uh, facility that's going to be for the folks out in Beulah. And now we're also getting questions about the new station on Bower Road. Now, for everyone's awareness, we've been working on this for years. And, you know, there's a there's a, a triangle piece of property almost directly across the street where the former Station 20 was. And it's owned by the United States Navy. We're working on a swap. But what is the latest and greatest on that issue? Wes, have we figured out what they want in exchange for that yet? They want an easement over a piece of property that we own, which we're more than happy to give them. So we've been in those communications. We've told them, hey, absolutely. We're happy to give you an easement. And so, we, I mean, we're communicating with them every week, uh, you know, dealing with the federal government and the Navy, because sometimes it could be a little <laughs> yeah. slow in our, in our eyes. And um, so, but we are still driving hard. We are still pushing. We have already purchased the apparatus that's going to go there. And uh, we've already done some side assessments. And mm -hmm. we are we're ready to push forward and drive as hard as we can, but we just gotta we just gotta complete the the transaction. Okay, A anything to add to that, Eric? No, he he nailed it. Uh, we're just waiting for the uh, we've done all our preliminary stuff. Uh, we've already had our meetings about uh, the modular building and everything, uh, identifying what it's going to look like. Uh, we're just waiting on the property, so we're trying to push forward with those guys. No. Okay. I, well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I got a lot of questions coming. Holy smokes, man. Steve, you're a popular guy, man. We got a lot of people watching this. <laughs> I, I think they're all, <laughs> they're all waiting for Steve's turn. Um, well, uh, I'm going to point Drake. I'm not excluding you, but I don't see a question. So type out a, a coherent, cogent question. And I promise you I'll read it if it's uh, uh, rated PG or, or better. Um, uh, I don't see his comments. His comments are not coming up anyway. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Anything else in public? Say, oh, how's the Ambu bus? The Ambu bus is uh, it going to be ready for the so the big Baptist Hospital move? On we're working. Yes, uh, we finally got the money from the state of Florida. We got our money. Uh, we're working with the vendor to get it shipped down to South Florida. It's packed up. It's ready to go. I just need the vendor to come get it. It's going to be this week or next week, so it'll be gone to South Florida to get retrofitted, and then we'll have it back uh, within a month and a half is what we anticipate. So we should have that thing back and ready to go. Uh, absolutely. Um, I did want to talk about the, the roundabout real quick and, and about the blue, yes. the, the traffic uh, during Blue Angels. Yes. Um, you know, the, that, that Saturday was an anomaly with the accidents that happened. We typically don't have accidents uh, leaving the island. And mm -hmm. because the accidents happened, it backed the traffic up and everything. And I want to do, do give a kudos and a shout out to the uh, traffic engineering guys. They sit in mobile command with us in Thor and watch the traffic and time the lights out. So we do try to, to manage the traffic real time during the air show when people are coming on the island and leaving the island. Uh, but when you have traffic accidents that shut the lanes down, that kind of impedes uh, how are you going to time the lights out and how to move people effectively. And uh, one other shout out is to my uh, comm staff, uh, my communications, uh, Andrew Hamilton and those guys back in dispatch uh, do a phenomenal job sitting in Thor and doing dispatching. But also a couple of weeks ago, we had those bad storms roll through. And we took several lightning strikes to our tire systems, and uh, and we were down. Our communications was down. We could uh, we couldn't send tones. Uh, we had certain channels that were down. So that's that's a major issue for us. And not only does it affect us, it affects the uh, sheriff's office and PBD Pensacola Police Department because mm -hmm. their dispatchers go through our core here at Public Safety. So they're on the same tower system. But uh, those guys went out there. Andrew got with CES, and, those, and they went out there and immediately identified the problem, resolved to put it, you know, temporarily fix, uh, found a solution to get us back up and running within a couple of hours. So, uh, you know, just the hard work and uh, dedication those guys have to make sure the public safety is up and running and do what it's supposed to be doing. Just want to shout out to uh, my comm staff back there. No, no. And I know they deal with a lot of challenges. And I also want to say thank you, Eric, to you and the staff. I know that you personally uh, got in your truck and went out to help our, our neighbors uh, over in Santa Rosa County when they they had a major issue at Santa Rosa Medical Center where the power went out. And so they thought they might have to transport people. And, you know, that's that's called being a good neighbor. Right. And I uh, just appreciate you. I want you to know that uh, that I was proud when I when I heard about that. And I'm just thankful that you did it, because I know that those folks over there would do the same for us if we ever found ourselves in that predicament. So um, absolutely appreciate, appreciate you and your guys and, and everything that you all do. And uh, the lifeguards, fantastic group of people. Can't absolutely. wait till next year we get lifeguards out at Perdido. But uh, I'm looking forward to all that. Anything else from public safety? No, sir. That wraps it up. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. Well, okay. Well, now, Steve, uh, we're up to you, to your part of the show. Uh, first, you want to introduce yourself and uh, tell folks what you're all about? Yeah. So I'm Steve Brentro. I am, um, I'll lead with this. I'm I'm not a, originally from this area. I, I think most, half people here are not from this area, but <laughs> I moved here from South Dakota. Actually, my first 
um, experience in Pensacola during a college uh, spring break trip from Minneapolis. I came down to Fort Pickens and we camped on the group campsite for a week and just in a tent. It was absolutely awesome. And before I left, we had all gone swimming in the Gulf and we swam out to one of the sandbars and one of the guys who was swimming with us started to drown. And I was a Midwest lifeguard, didn't have a whole lot of experience, but I took what little experience I had and dragged him back off the beach. So that made it a super memorable trip, burned Pensacola in my, into my mind. And I will say it also burned um, a healthy respect for the ocean into my mind. And that's one thing that's a challenge, I think, in this community. We have so many, you know, people coming from out of town excited to get in the water. And I'm looking at it like, and my wife grabs my arm and she said, don't you do it. Don't go in after him. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 I'll tell you what, it's it's deceptive. You can be out there. I've been caught in them before, but I grew up here. So I understand what you have to do to get out of them, you know. Um, but folks that may not necessarily be strong swimmers, they it looks peaceful, it looks calm, some waves, and they get out there and then they get they panic. I can't get back. I can't get back. And then they fight it instead of going parallel. And a lot of them, unfortunately, you know, succumb to their injuries. We've had a couple athletes, I mean, known national celebrity type athletes that uh, we had one that drowned uh, down the road, not far from here. And we had another one that was uh, severely wounded, got, you know, doing some rescues off of Portofino. So you really have to know your own limitations, Steve. And I think the, the most important thing is follow the flag system. Follow, Absolutely. Follow the warnings. Yeah. Our, life, our lifeguards are amazing, but I know that there's a large area of beach where there's not lifeguards, but here's the cool thing. A lot of people don't maybe don't realize this. So our lifeguards drive their trucks up and down. They make the rounds. They on the, look at the, if you're not sure about the condition, look at the back of your lifeguards vehicle and they have the flag. Mm -hmm. They fly the flag on the truck. So no matter where you are, you know, there's no excuse for you not to know. I've also recently been contacted by someone else because it's a big issue, Steve. You, you kind of hit a sore point for me. You know, we had a young man from, I think, up in Memphis that was down here and he was trying to save his buddy who's caught young, young kid, 16, and he, and he lost his life and it was just heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, and it was out at Perdido. Uh, you know, yeah. They were swimming. That was, that was really sad to, to see. And, and, you know, that's the impetus for, I know you guys are working on getting more lifeguards out there. That's important too, but even just uh, public education for for tourists. Like the thing that I taught my family early on is, you walk onto a beach. If you see a lifeguard before you get in the water, you ask them where the riptides are. Yeah, that's right. And and they'll say they're there. Swim anywhere else, then you know. So yeah, beach safety and lifeguards is is definitely a big thing. But it is. So so tell us about we are Perdido. How did this yeah. how did this all start? Well, okay. So this actually started at um, your meeting. At the district uh, district one town hall meeting that we had last fall, mm -hmm. that you hosted. Um, I, I attended as just a local resident and sat and, and listened and, and took notes. I was interested. I had never been to a county commissioner meeting or or any of these kinds of things before, so this, that was all new to me. And as I was listening to all these issues come up, it just kind of dawned on me. I said, "These sound like." they're very local issues that don't really affect a lot of other people further up in the county. I mean, it's probably the last thing, Perdido is the last thing on Century's mind. I know that, you know, <laughs> um, but um, it, and most of the residents who were bringing them up all seem to know, well, how to deal with them and what really should happen. It's just that they didn't have a whole lot of um, power to do anything other than to just bring them up to the county and say, Hey, you know, this is an issue. And then, it, as big as the county is, it, it's uh, a fight for attention a lot of times because, I mean, to be honest, oh, I feel like this. I, I pulled up this statistic. So there's 320,000 people in the county, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, 267,000 of those are in unincorporated county. Right. And so the county is actually doing its normal county functions for the whole 320,000, but for those quarter of a million it's doing local government functions, which a city or a town municipality would usually do. So by that regard, this is a fun fact, that would make that unincorporated um, area would be similar in population to the fifth largest municipality in Florida. Absolutely. You know, so, Steve, you, you may not be aware of this, but uh, there was a very, very big push uh, about three years ago from some, some folks that live downtown. I'll, I'll just use that terminology. And they really, really badly wanted the entire county to be incorporated with the city and, and one just gigantic city. Like, like Miami-Dade. 
Well, like Duval yeah. County, like oh, Duval yeah. County, like Jacksonville, Duval. It's, and, and, and fortunately, fortunately that, that didn't, that didn't go very far because people saw that a mile away. And so, yeah, there are folks that, and they, and on top of that, they wanted to really eliminate uh, the district system and have one strong elected County administrator to run the whole deal. And um, I think that was a big turnoff, but anyway, uh, I didn't mean to, to interrupt. No, you. that's, that's fine. That's, it's interesting stuff. And the challenge in that is that you have uh, pockets of communities that have very different priorities and very different needs. So Absolutely. what Warrington needs is not what Cantonment needs. What Molino needs is not what Perdido needs. Same Beulah and, you know, go, go any, pick any spot. And there are these communities that really have a sense of, of identity um, and are fairly close knit, smaller populations that have their set of local issues that they're concerned about, and they end up having to be dealt with at this larger level. And so um, one of my favorite books, I'll throw this out here real quick, is uh, by Warren Berger. It's called A More Beautiful Question. Wait, and, Supreme, Supreme Court Justice? Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't pay attention to who he was. I just read the book. <laughs> but it is one of my favorite books. Warren Berger, a more beautiful question. And what he went through is a study of um, how we stop asking questions when we turn about five years old and go to kindergarten because we're told to sit down, shut up, memorize, repeat, you know, all that. Right. I remember. <laughs> but um, we lose that uh, power of inquiry, which sparks great ideas. And so he kind of goes through this and gets you thinking like, oh, I can start asking questions and and find a more better question. And you ask one question leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to a more beautiful question, which is like the ultimate question. So as I'm sitting through that meeting and, and talking to residents afterwards, I, I started to go through kind of a list of questions. And I was like, why is this happening? Uh, what are these issues all about? How do they normally get handled? How did they, how were they handled other places in Florida? And um, one of the super interesting questions that came up during that town hall meeting was actually posed a couple of times by residents. Has, have we thought of becoming a town? And it was an intriguing idea. And as a country kid from South Dakota, my first thought is, yeah, well, towns have a lot more taxes. They have a lot more, you know, it's another layer of government, all this stuff. So I, I just kept researching. I'm a almost a professional researcher by trade because of, of my background. I have to learn new technologies every day. Um, so I started to dig into these things and found that there was a model of municipal government called government light that's been used successfully in other parts of Florida. Mm -hmm. And the idea is not to recreate the whole thing as you know a brand new police force, brand, brand new fire department, EMS, all that kind of stuff and all the services, it actually does what about 50% of Florida cities do is contract out a majority of the services to the, um, to the county. Right. And then just focuses on a couple core things that it wants to um, address locally as those main local issues. So well, that's a, that's a perfect segue into, into one of the first questions I have for you. These are the <clears throat> questions we talked about a little bit before we started. Um, so, and this is, Again, and just for everyone's awareness, I you know this is this is an area of District One. It's an area of the south uh, western portion of the county is a study area. I want to say about twenty three thousand. Is that right? Twenty three. Twenty three thousand one hundred, some of that. And um and and so I I don't live down there, but it's it's part of my district. But I don't mm -hmm. own property or a business there, so I'm really I'm very um, neutral on this. And I and I want to um and I and I've told Stephen that I've I've gone to his I went to his meeting down at Liberty Church and. Um, you know, I've been following the progress of it, but I want people to know I'm, uh, you're not going to see me put my thumb on the scale, but I, I told him, I'm going to ask some difficult questions. I'm going to pass along some questions that I've heard. One of the biggest questions that I've heard, Steve, and, and maybe you can help clear this up is what specific problem is incorporation going to answer? Cause my understand, my understanding from going to your meeting and looking at your website is the roads uh, are going to remain county roads, and most of them are state roads, Sorrento Road, Perdido Key. Um, so you're not going to have the roads. The zoning is going to remain the county zoning, and the zoning staff is going to remain the same. Uh, the school board is still going to run the same schools. Um, I, my understanding is you're not going to have your own fire department or police force like the city of Pensacola does. Um, the parks and uh, are going to remain county property unless you purchase them from us. 
And uh, so I, what specific problem is this incorporation going to solve? So the specific, I could list, you know, a bunch of issues that came up at that district town hall, uh, you know, meeting that, but at the end of the day, the county could address all of those. It's, sure. you know, the, the county's working on that. They're spread a little thin, you know, in, in some areas like uh, stormwater management, uh, you know, the ponds, all that kind of stuff, park management, it, the budget for the, for maintaining the parks. And you have interesting issues like the, uh, Perdido Kids Park, you can't spend um, lost dollars on it because it wasn't a lost funded park, if I, as I understand it, right? So there's there's a lot of different challenges at the county level. Um, and, and these local issues that are coming up could be addressed by the county, but they could also be addressed by a municipality, by locally elected officials to work through some of the issues. And you are correct that you know, there's a, a lot of things like the parks, um, the beaches, uh, Perdido Key Drive, things like that, that would likely remain the county. Uh, the state roads are going to remain the state roads, but it puts the local residents in a different position for a different conversation. Because right now, the local voice is three minutes each at a Board of County Commissioner meeting, you know, where you guys are super busy, you're getting texted while while things are going on, you know, there's all sorts of distractions. A lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody's talking and three other people are texting you. So mm -hmm. um, the, that local voice then becomes locally elected officials who uh, actually are citizens of the area who see all these issues anyways. And so it doesn't take an explanation. It just takes a citizen saying, hey, you know that pothole I was talking about? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I drove over it this morning. It'll get fixed. Um, but those conversations then are, are happening between a municipal government and the county government or the municipal government and the state government mm -hmm. or uh, you know, fish and wildlife or wherever it is. It's a much different conversation than just uh, one or a few local citizens trying to address a problem. And I will point out too, with the roads, mm -hmm. the, the ownership of the roads is not a decision that happens in the feasibility study as we're going through this process in, in proposing this. That decision is an intergovernmental decision that would happen with the first elected town leaders that would sit down and they would say, hey, you know what? We don't want to own Pretty Doki Drive. That's way too much to maintain. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try to give it away. <laughs> give away here. Do this. Go away, kid. You bother me. Um, <laughs> but there's other roads around that are more local streets that certainly could be uh, managed. And at that point, the negotiation of road ownership goes hand in hand with um, the gas tax revenues and things like that that actually help pay for the infrastructure. So, and, and, and that's a perfect segue because we're going to talk about revenue and I, I hate it because man, this hour goes by so quick. Um, and I, I want to, oh yeah. I want to keep a lot of time because this is a fascinating topic. And I want to tell the, all the folks that are uh, putting questions in here toward the end and about the last five minutes, I'm going to do a lightning round with Steve because there are a lot of questions for you, Steve. But I think um, as we go, I'll probably answer, I'll, I'll probably ask questions that will allow you to answer a lot of these questions uh, from the from the citizens who are watching. But um, uh, I, just general stepping back, like I said, I attended your uh, your meeting at, at Liberty Church when Lynn Tipton from the Florida League of Cities oh, was there. She's amazing. She is amazing, very impressive. And it, it really begged a lot of questions. I, I took copious notes and then I spoke with her for about an hour and a half the next day. And I really brought myself up to speed with some of the requirements. So let's talk about funding because a lot of folks, and I'm getting this expressed to me on these comments, they're, they're concerned about two things, taxes going up, and additional layers of bureaucracy. And mm -hmm. I'm a, a small government Republican. I'm not one of these guys who was a Democrat all his life and then decided to become a Republican in the early 2000s when the wind changed. At age 18, I knew I, I love Ronald Reagan. I've been a Republican, small government Republican my whole life. So, you know, re reflexively, I, it, it concerns me when you've got another layer of bureaucracy. So how do you answer that question? Uh, you know, the concern that people are like, my taxes are going to go up and I'm going to have another layer of red tape to deal with. How do you answer that? So the government light model does it in two ways. So first of all, it's it's structuring the, the charter of the municipality and structuring the government to be uh, smaller and more nimble. So in the charter, there's fewer employees um, and they're a, a typical uh, government light municipality can operate on five to a dozen 
uh, city employees, which is very different than a full service local government like the county or, or you know, Pensacola. In doing so, you reduce uh, a whole lot of things. You reduce the expenses for your employees, for one thing. You reduce the by reducing the number of employees, you also reduce some of that bureaucracy, the red tape that you have to get through to get things done. Um, the biggest thing though, that one of the big things that you reduce is legacy costs, which eat cities and local governments alive. So legacy costs are retirement, you know, pensions, all that kind of things. If you have a thousand employees, how many of those uh, retired employees are alive at one point and you have to keep paying in pensions? Well, with government lifestyle cities, like for instance, Western Florida has, um, I think it's 10 uh, employees for 70,000 people. They don't have to worry about those legacy costs as much because they their legacy costs will never really grow beyond those 10. But Steve, so, now, now again, like I told you, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. You don't get to sidestep the costs. You just pay them a different way. So you only have 10 employees, but you're outsourcing <clears> your fire, you're outsourcing your zoning, you're outsourcing your school districts. And, and those people are getting the Florida retirement system. So you're just paying sure. a higher cost in your contract. Well, you really so let me ask, let me ask this. So what are our, what does the Perdido community currently pay for fire service, for our current level of fire service and sheriff service? Well, the county, the county we're paying about 25 million is the 25 to 26 million. Right. And the sheriff is uh, about 85 million this year. And then you divide that by the person, uh, by the number of citizens, and you can come to that, uh, that figure. Right. So, well, if, if you actually understand that, and you get this, that funding comes out of the ad valorem taxes that the county already lev levies on that area. And those yes. functions, the, the EMS, the um, sheriff, that those are largely constitutional functions. So whether or not, you know, if we want to add a, uh, a layer of police force on top and have our own police force, you still would have the county. What we're saying is instead of having our own police force, we just use the counties, which is, you know, passed through. And that's that's the um, that's the model that that government like pursues. And then on top of that, if there's uh, service delivery issues like with staging or, you know, you want to bump up service in, in a certain area mm -hmm. as a government like um, entity or government um, administration, you're managing those contracts locally, and you can adjust those service levels up to the level that you need and ensure that you have the right people in the right place. And then you're only paying the delta. You're not paying the whole thing. You're paying the delta to get that extra service level above and beyond whatever the county is already constitutionally providing. No, and, and that's a good point that you make because, look, there you know this as well as I do. There's no free lunch, right? Um, someone always pays. It might be free to you, but someone's paying for it. Um, the concern that I have, you know, representing that portion of the county and the whole, actually, you know, anyone from any part of the county can call me anytime. I get them all the time, but but that's the the area that, that elects me. And uh, a lot of folks are under the mistaken impression that if if they incorporate the 23,000 and they get to pull off that they can take their portion of their tax bill that they're paying to the county now and they can all give that to the city. I just, I got to disabuse everyone who thinks that of that notion. That's incorrect. Um, that's why I've said, look, if, if these guys are successful, wait, let me finish okay, the yeah, point. Yeah, right. If these guys are successful, it actually makes my job easier because that's yeah. an additional <laughs> layer of, of people that are helping to, to take care of the roads if they decide to take them. So the people exactly. that understand, if, if you want something extra, you got to pay extra. The the 6.61 uh, mills, that's not going away. You're still, if you incorporate, that's that money is still coming to the county. The school board's still going to exactly. get their money. The sheriff's MSTU is still going to happen and the library <clears throat> MSTU is still going to happen. So anything above and beyond that will have to be generated by new taxes. Okay. Well, you, oh, correction there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what percentage of the county budget is paid for by ad valorem taxes at the county uh, level? The, the majority of it. The no, no, it's not. 27%. Mm. And you can calculate this, go, mm -hmm. go to the budget and look at this. 27% of the, uh, county's total budget of $660 million mm -hmm. comes from ad valorem taxes. Yeah, the, yeah. Vast, the, the vast majority of other funding 
comes from a lot of different sources. No, I, I think and, you're looking you're looking at the wrong thing. You have to look at your operating, your general fund operating budget, and the vast majority of that comes from ad valorem taxes. We have a half penny that spins out about 32 million. We have franchise fees and we get some state right. revenue sharing, but the vast majority, okay. you're incorrect, sure. Steve, the vast majority of our funding of our general fund for our operations comes from ad valorem. In, uh, okay, so fund. yes, I, I agree with you. When you consider just the general That's right, fund, believe me, yes. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you're a numbers guy too. Um, mm -hmm. But you pointed out something interesting. You mentioned um, franchise fees. Yes. And uh, you didn't mention this, but lumped in with that uh, communication service taxes. Yep. So when you draw lines of a municipality and incorporate franchise fees and, and uh, the communication service taxes actually become the municipal revenue source. That's, That's true. One That's of true. But but I will, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I will say this. Um, I spoke to Lynn Tipton, and that's true, but you have to negotiate those, and, and it doesn't happen automatically. In other words, the minute you're incorporated, you don't start getting that money. You got to go negotiate. With I, yes and no. It's, it's, it's partly a negotiation. It can also happen in the municipal charter. But so there, and I know we're running short on time. We want to yep. get to that lightning round, but there's a lot of pieces to this. Yes, there is. Yes. That uh, there's dozens of different revenue sources that all have different rules about what they can be spent on, what they can't be spent on, where they come from, how you qualify for them, all those kinds of things. The feasibility study, which is the state required process of going through and, and showing that this actually would be feasible uh -huh. is what we're in the middle of. And it's the feasibility study firm's job to go through and do a five-year projected budget on the general fund and show not only that you would be um, solvent the first year, but five years in that you are actually building a healthy reserve. Because if those numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, if those numbers came back and it didn't look like we would be able to build reserves, even I would say like, this is a bad idea. Right. And that's what this whole process is really about. I know there's a lot of people with with questions and, and concerns. That's great. We're actually we're a research organization. We're compiling these questions. We're going to smart people like Lynn Tipton um, with Florida League of Cities. We're talking to the Florida Department of Revenue, asking these questions to get them all answered so that they're answered before everybody in the feasibility study. And then I that then goes to the state, gets vetted by everybody at the state level, and then comes back and the local citizens look at it, debate it back and forth, and finally vote for themselves. Sure. And I'd, I'd love to point this out because our feasibility study firm, the reason we chose them is not only that they've done 30 of these studies in the state of Florida, but also his favorite thing is watching the community on both sides of the argument, take his study and argue their points using his source material. Hmm. So it's that balance. Like he tries to do, like he's not recommending for or against. He's just presenting the facts, ma'am. And then the community can look at this and honestly go through. And at the end of the day, if we get through this whole process and we look through this feasibility study, even me personally, I, I don't know if we should incorporate yet. I no one knows because no one has asked these questions and done this deep of a study ever. But when this is all said and done, we'll be able to look at this and say, all right, is does this make sense to do? Yes or no? Yeah. If we vote no, then we'll so find find some other way to deal with local issues. But So when do you anticipate the feasibility? I think there's a lot of pent up anticipation. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, when is that? When are we going to drop? When's that going to drop? <laughs> okay. So the second to last week of August, um, we're working to nail down a date in that week for the feasibility study firm to come and present it to the public. And it would be published on our website at that point, and they okay. people can start to look through this, uh, figure it out. Now, and then at that point, it would go to the state. So I'm I'm as impatient as all of you. I I start side research projects when I have to sit a little, sit around and twiddle my thumbs. Uh, by the way, uh, remind me later that pockets of poverty map from 2015. Yes, sir. Um, I know uh, the Haas Center redid some of the numbers. Mm -hmm. I went through and redid it exactly as Studer Group that had originally done it so that you oh, can really? see them side by side. So 2021 numbers versus whatever. 
because I was bored and I was waiting for the feasibility study to get back. I'm like, I need something to do. So anyways, <laughs> but interesting stuff in that too. So it is. Well, I mean, we're, you know, we're quickly coming to a point where we have to wrap this up, but I, I appreciate <clears throat> you taking the tough questions because I know anytime you try, look, I, I know better than a lot of people. Um, anytime you propose something new and different, you know, you're going to take a lot of shots and I'm trying to be very neutral, um, but there are some really directed questions that have to be answered. And and I think in order to make an informed opinion, you have to do the research. So I, as I told you, I spoke with Lynn Tipton, um, after yeah. I taking copious notes at your thing. And, and I said, well, how are they going to get the revenue? So I want you to, to respond to this. She said, in order to tap to the local option gas tax and tap into their portion of the half cent sales tax, they have to raise the equivalent, the equivalent of three mills. Now, three mills on your rough tax roll of that study area is about 3.6 billion. It's a little over $10 million. And I said, well, Lynn, how in the world do they raise $10 million? And they said, she said, they can do it one of three ways. You can do it with ad valorem tax rate uh, increases. In other words, increase the millage rate. You can do it on new utility taxes on utility bills. And she said they can, a lot of cities get a lot of revenue that way or new fees and new taxes on current business owners. So there's only three ways to raise that money to get to where you need to be to tap into these other state monies. So I guess the question, the million dollar question is, if the, the feasibility study says it's it's worth it to do it, if you get the the the, uh, the vote to do it from the state legislature and then from the, the citizens, how much would the first year's budget be? Or do you not know yet? I, I don't know yet. The In that feasibility study with the five-year projected budget, in addition to that, one of the things that the firm is doing is um, identifying um, the mechanism that you're talking about for unlocking state shared revenues, those kinds of things, and explaining that in a lot more detail. If you want to see, get a sneak peek of what that looks like, um, I would suggest going on our website and in the resources section, there is a feasibility study from um, Indian Town, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, another good example would be Estero, Florida. If you look in their municipal charter, you can see some examples of how they went around to actually um, get access to the, the state shared revenues. So, but all of that will come out in the study. What that looks like exactly for us, that's up to the, okay. the study firm to... Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I want to do a quick little lightning round. So you got to yeah. answer these quick. I know I, I'm the worst. I'm ready. I, I give these long-winded <laughs> answers, and before you know it, 10 minutes have gone by. Um, does We Are Perdido support uh, four-laning Perdido Key Drive? Uh, we don't have a position one way or the other. It's it's about a local, local voice, local choice, and a seat at the table for those kinds of uh, discussions. So The feasibility study was paid for by whom? Uh, so far, it's 100% citizen don donations, and we are um, probably about 15 to 20% into the total raise that we need to raise. And we're raising money starting now, again, for, um, for this process from local citizens. Okay. I seriously want to know what issues Perdido has the rest of the county does not. We are experiencing growing uh, pains and all need to work together. No more division of areas. I own as well in district one and have no issues with my taxes going to all areas for improvement. What issues does Perdido have that the rest of us do not? Okay. So really quick, the county has a 20 year comp plan, right? Okay. The 20 year comp plan for the county is 110 pages for 320,000 people. Um, an example comp plan for Fort Myers Beach, 6,000 people is 550 pages that actually shows and guides development. The county's comp plan and land development code, as no offense to the county, but it was one of the last counties in the state to put together uh, or to come in compliance with the state uh, land development code, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's the bare minimum of what is necessary. So with a lot of the development issues that we're seeing around the, the county overdevelopment or, you know, unfunded infrastructure, different things like that actually tie into a comp plan that isn't as expanded as it could be. It's hard to expand that at the county level. That would be one of the first things that uh, a new town would have to do within the first three years. They have to come up with a 20-year comprehensive plan for Perdido to say, this is what we want our community to look like in 20 years and, and how we would get there. Um, Barbara asks this, a lot of us don't want to live in a city. That's why we are in the county. We don't buy in HOAs. We don't buy in cities, we don't want the extra oversight. 
uh, we like the lives we have. What would you say to someone like that? I grew up in the country. I under, I completely understand. And we're not after a whole big city bureaucracy over us. That's not where we're over. We're trying to find ways to address local issues locally um, and have a seat at the table in these discussions. So Steve, uh, this is from Jason. Steve, why should we ingest more unnecessary code and regulations? Um, if, if you like the way that uh, development is happening around, then I guess you don't need to. But I think there's a lot, a lot of people in the community who look at storage units popping up everywhere, um, the apartments by the bridge, uh, you know, things that are happening and expanding and growing in the area at a kind of an uncontrollable rate. And they're seeing Perdido disappear before their eyes. And okay. they don't want that to happen. Okay, Mr. Pappas asks this, our Perdido Key area has a ton of traffic issues with our current roadways and warehouses going in. How will this improve? So the seat at the table that a local government has, those different types of conversations, um, typically a municipality would have a seat and a vote at uh, transportation planning organizations, things like that, and be able to work with uh, other government entities and come up with um, intelligent traffic solutions that that work. Okay, interesting. Well, I, you know, we're, we're just about fresh out of time, but, um, and there's a lot more questions. I'm not going to get to them, but hopefully folks got a flavor of it. Um, Steve, tell us when your next planned meeting is so folks will know. So the, uh, we'll announce it soon, but it's going to be probably the second to last week of August, and okay. we'll make sure we get it on our website. If you have questions, the community has been asking a lot of questions and we put a searchable question database on our website where you can just start typing and find your question. If you don't find it, type it in the little ask a question live question box. And within a day or two, we'll we'll get back with an answer and put it on the website for everybody to see. So that, that's a great, hey, that's a great idea. I like that idea. Um, I want to thank you. I just want to put a plug in for a couple of things going on out in, in that section of the county, you know, because I'm right now I'm, I'm still in charge. <laughs> I guess I'll use that term. You'll, so. you'll, yeah, commissioner will always have a commissioner. So. Well, I mean, it, but you know, that means I got to own all the all the problems. So we we do have a traffic circle out there. Uh, I inherited the um, the design for it. I inherited the funding for it, frankly, from my uh, predecessor uh, that had District Two before the rezoning, before it went back to District One. So um, I just want folks to know, uh, you know, I've had a lot of complaints about it. Uh, you know, I understand how traffic circles work. I've been out there. I've driven through that traffic circle from Johnson's Beach Road coming north and going south. I've had no issues with it. A lot of folks feel like it's not big enough. Um, a lot of folks feel like it, it wasn't designed properly. Um, even the folks who supported it now are saying, well, I liked it before and I voted for it uh, at a town hall, but now I don't like it. So can I, can I mention, come, yeah. come visit on Saturday, Saturday oh, yeah. morning, because that's check in, check out day. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, yeah, check in time at three o'clock on a, during season. It's going to be packed. It's like your favorite restaurant. You, you yeah. can't build it big enough. You're going to wait two hours for a seat on Saturday night at six. You just are. And so traffic uh, circles are the same way. So here's what's going on right now, though. Our, our traffic engineering uh, department has commissioned a study and we're looking at it right now during the season. We're taking camera shots from above condos and we're we're looking at the data because we found out, now this is kind of scandalous, I mean, but uh, you know, this is not a knock to current staff. Uh, this is back in 2018, that roadway belonged to the state. The commissioner at that time desperately wanted a roundabout there, as, as did some of the developers in the area. I'll just put it that way. Well, the state came back, did a thorough study. I have a copy of it now. I found it. Uh, I, got a, I got it last week. That's how recently this is coming to me. But in that study in 2018, September 2018, they specifically recommended against a roundabout at that intersection. A year later, yep. a year later, we did the property swap, which again, I supported for reasons that made sense for District uh, 1, for Beulah. Um, and then shortly thereafter, that commissioner uh, at the same time pressed hard, got the roundabout funded, put in. So I, you know, I don't know if staff at that time knew about the study the state had done. It's only gotten busier, so I can't imagine the roundabout idea got better. Uh, so we're looking into that. And what I've told people and what I intend to do to honor my word is whatever the study recommends as the best solution is what we're going to put there. Not something that a developer likes. He likes the idea of it, or people kind of thought it would be kind of cool. Whatever works the best. The state spent a lot of money. They said, don't do a roundabout. Uh, the county turned around and did a roundabout. And they said, well, there was a community meeting and we did outreach. Well, um, someone that I really respect told me this very recently. He said, listen, 
75 people in a room, you get 46 of them to say, yeah, I want the roundabout, but they ignore the technical analysis. You do that at great expense and great peril. Now, this is a guy I respect. I'm not going to name him, but I agree with him. Had I known about the study, let me just tell everyone that roundabout wouldn't be there because I would have said we need to do a new study because maybe we just need a big, long turn lane into Johnson's Beach and a signal there, or maybe the best thing to do is do nothing. Um, so anyway, uh, I say all that to say, we're going to get that intersection figured out. We're going to do a town hall out uh, in the late part of August out in, in Perdido area. We're going to do another town hall and we're going to continue to open up beach access. We did a lot at that last meeting. Wes pointed out all the grants we got, the 23 million that we spent, but we also got 3.6 million voted by my counterparts for additional public beach access in Perdido. We're building a fire station in Perdido. We're doing a lot in Perdido. Steve, I would tell you this and all your, your folks, if you need something from the county, call me. Yeah, um, I've only been in this district a year and a half. We're lighting it on fire. All you got to do is call me. If I can do it, if I'm, if it's humanly possible to do it, I will do it um, or come to the meeting. So hey, I've, I've got two two things I want to ask. Okay. Publicly. Sure. Uh, can you check the timing on the lights, the stop lights on Sorrento Road? Yes. Because it seems like in the last month, something has changed with the timing and it's okay. uh, weird traffic issues or it'll open up for just like, are you talking about seconds. Sorrento at Interarity? Right? Yeah, Sorrento we and Bauer and Bauer. then Sorrento and Interarity. So the timing of those lights. And okay. then the second thing that I would ask, these guys, Eric and Wes, they're amazing. Could yes. you please give them another raise? <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're going to get raised. They get raises when the employees get raises. And I think that's <laughs> the fair way to do it. But I'll tell you what that means, though, Steve. In the lean years, when we can't give raises, that means they don't get them either, right? And that, am I right, yeah. guys? I mean, that, that's the way that works. So, um, you know, so so absolutely. And Great job, guys. No, thank you, guys. And I apologize we went five minutes long, but I, uh, Steve, I appreciate you being here and, and, and answering the questions. Me. I threw some tough ones at you. I appreciate you answering. Eric and Wes, as usual, thanks for getting up and being a part of this. I greatly appreciate what you guys do. Thank you. Thank and to you. everyone who watched this morning, have a great rest of the week. Have a great weekend.